Good evening. It's good that we can meet in this room again. Uh, welcome also to those who possibly first time tonight. And it's also good to have some of you back since we met last week. It means that not everything was too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that some people are still on their way, but we need to start because we have only two hours for the material, for the, for the very broad and much of material that we have for this class. Today, uh, we are going to deal with objections to the gospel that you might encounter when you witness to Jewish people. And also we are going to deal with uh, some terminology that you might use or with some terminology that is better to avoid because it produces a number of misconceptions. So let's start by short prayer. As you know, our Father, we are grateful for an opportunity to study your word and to study the apologetic skills. We love you and we appreciate Yeshua. And we want to share the good news with the Jewish people we know and also with everybody else. And tonight we ask your blessing for us. Give us wisdom, give us your guidance and let us enjoy you, enjoy your word, be edified and be ready to be your witnesses to everybody we encounter, to the Jew first. Bashem Yeshua, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. So the first, uh, the first block of objections, as you can see on your uh, outline, are going to be cultural, historic, and traditional objections. Next, afterwards, there will be theological objections. But we'll start with cultural. And the main objection that we encounter, as we also were discussing a week ago, is it is, uh, it is possible to believe in Jesus, or is it possible to believe in Jesus and uh, remain Jewish? It's, uh, it's a controversy. You are either Christian or Jewish, and it's not possible to be both. It has very solid historic reasons for Jewish people to feel this way. In Middle Ages, uh, we were pushed by force to convert to Christianity, and the Christianity was a completely different religion. And not just completely different religion from being Jewish, but also completely different lifestyle. So we were pushed to change everything, including our lifestyle. And I'm not talking about from ungodly, unpious, to into godly and good uh, biblical lifestyle. No, from Jewish lifestyle to explicitly non-Jewish lifestyle. And even those of us who by fear and by uh, just to escape from the negative consequences were converted to Christianity, we never were ex uh, accepted fully by the Christians in some cultures, like in Spain. We were called maranas, what means pigs. Uh, so we never was, were like fully Christian in the sense of this different culture. We were always treated as some outcasts. Besides, we were closely observed by uh, special Christian intelligence service uh, to watch over us if we are not keeping anything from the Jewish lifestyle, including uh, keeping kosher or uh, working on Shabbat and things uh, like this, celebrating Jewish holidays. So it was literally impossible to be Jewish uh, and to be Christian at the same time and actually by force. And then after uh, French Revolution, and big changes in the European society, the Jewish people struggling for assimilation. In order to be like everybody else, they were converting to Christianity, not by force any longer, but it was a deliberate decision to integrate ourselves into society. So uh, after French Revolution, 
you could be, every Jew could be equal with everybody else as a citizen, but not as a Jew. So abandon your people, leave your people, become like everybody else, and just, you know, Christianity was, again, tradition, lifestyle, or even more like, uh, more like a cultural pattern of belonging to religiously. So millions of Jewish people were converting to Christianity, not by force, but as a deliberate decision to abandon their affiliation with the Jewish people, to become more affiliated with the general society in, in order to get better education, or education at all, I mean secular education, sciences, etc., and to get some better job opportunities. So, Middle Ages, it was by force not possible to be Jewish and Christian at the same time. Uh, and uh, in last couple of uh, centuries in Europe, it was a deliberate decision. You abandon your Jewish, uh, Jewishness in order to be like everybody else. And that's why on this historic foundation, in uh, the minds of the Jewish people, even till this very day, it's still deeply embedded. You cannot be Jewish and believe in Jesus. Me, uh, meaning, if you believe in Jesus, you're Christian. And being Christian, it's a contradiction to being Jewish. So uh, that's why we face this uh, very signific uh, significant objection. If you believe in Jesus, you cannot be Jewish. You abandon that all. You cannot be both. Uh, how would we uh, encounter uh, or how would we react to this uh, objection? Uh, last, uh, last Thursday, so a week ago, we were talking that, uh, that being Jewish is an ethical belonging. It's more by birth. So the foundation, the essential part of being Jewish is being born from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? So I hope you remember that. If, by the way, if you missed the seminar last week, it's all recorded, it's all online, you can watch it and uh, you can participate in that seminar by uh, watching. We can even copy it uh, for you on a, on a, on a, on a like USB drive or whatever, but uh, you miss, if you missed last uh, week's seminar, uh, you missed something good, but not entirely. You can watch it. Anyway, uh, it's a bio, it's an, uh, biological or ethical belonging to be Jewish. And covenantal dimension is attached to that, of course. We, we talked about Jewish people as the covenantal people as well. It's attached, but uh, even breaking the covenant does not compromise belonging to the Jewish people. Uh, let's consider a couple, uh, couple of passages, just as examples. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Isaiah chapter 1, verses two and three. Listen, O heavens, and hear earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have re uh, revolted against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. So Israel, in this passage, abandoned God, broke the covenant, left what, uh, what was the godly lifestyle, and still God is calling them my people. If you remember last week, the covenantal relationship, God calls the people of Israel my people. And it's, uh, according to passages like this passage from Isaiah, it's, dis it's done disregarding of the faithfulness of the Jewish people. They remain in the covenant with God, on God's part, even if they abandon their faithfulness to uh, the covenant with him. Like, uh, if you look at uh, following verses, uh, like uh, look at verse 4, uh, in Isaiah chapter 1, and we will, return, we will deal with these verses a little bit later uh, tonight. O sinful nation, in verse 4, 
people weighted down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord, they have despised the Holy One of Israel, they have turned away from Him. Do you see the description of Israel in this passage? It's bad. It's very bad. These people are like, like nasty to God. They treat God poorly. They treat Him evil. And still, they're my people in God's description. So, your face, and when I talk to a Jewish person, I tell, according to the prophets, your face, your even faithfulness, and or the absence of your uh, faith doesn't compromise your belonging to the Jewish people. So, even if Jesus would not be Jewish, it would not compromise your attachment to your people of Israel. Look uh, with me in uh, verse 5, just for the future reference. Where will you be uh, stricken ag again? As you continue in your rebellion, the whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. Also, if, uh, if, you, look, uh, if you would, please turn to Isaiah 41, verse uh, 8. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. And it's written in the context where God is also rebuking the Jewish people. They still call, uh, call uh, the Jewish, uh, the people of Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendants of Abraham, my friend. So the descendants from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has its significant disregarding of the questions of obedience. How much more, if it's true, actually, if, doesn't, uh, if disregarding of your faithfulness or your, um, or your belief in, the, in Tanakh, in the old times and in the, uh, in the present, if you still remain, uh, if you still remain Jewish, if the people of Israel remain the people of Israel, even in case of their strong disobedience, how much more it is true for somebody who believes that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, who follows Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. Some other examples, and if you read the, uh, the Old Testament Tanakh carefully, you could notice these passages. The kings of Israel, they were uh, sort of like, in many cases, pagan. They were syncretists. They believed in many gods. Even Solomon worshipped many gods uh, in certain periods of, uh, of certain season of his life. And still nobody would say Solomon was not Jewish because he was worshipping some other gods or abandoned the God, uh, the God of Israel as well as other kings. So uh, the fact is, the biblical fact is, the kings, the pagan kings were still Jewish. The Jewish people who abandoned God were still the people of Israel. If somebody follows the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua, Jesus, how much more he could be considered Jewish? In uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 1, we read that the Apostle Paul, and I can use it also talking uh, to Jewish people. Apostle Paul says, I am Jewish, so please take a note of this uh, passage, Romans 11.1. 1. Uh, I'm also like a Hebrew people, so I belong to these people. The Apostle Paul, he was never ashamed to show and proclaim his belonging to the Jewish people. And the Apostle Paul, by the way, among even educated Jewish people today, is considered as the, still considered as a bad one. Because Jesus, okay, he was, he was a good Jew. 
But then the Apostle Paul, he perverted everything. So the Apostle Paul considered as a bad Jew, if you would read like even Jewish encyclopedias or sort of like Jewish lexicons uh, in this regard at times. So uh, if, you are, if you are Jewish, your Jewishness is not compromised by your belief or disbelief. If Jesus is Jewish Messiah, it doesn't compromise your belonging to the people of Israel. Uh, any questions to this objection before we proceed? Next uh, objection uh, is also very, uh, very significant. Why don't the rabbis and the, major and the majority of Jewish people believe in Jesus? Well, we always love to be as everybody else, particularly the Jewish people, although every of us is a character in many cases, uh, at least. Uh, and although we have uh, very strong on personalities, still, regarding issues like believing in uh, Jesus, we like to be like everybody else. As I was praying to, the, uh, to Jesus, or in the name of Jesus, for the first time in my life, being already convinced that he is the Messiah, I prayed, and 30 seconds later, or shortly after, I was praying again, telling, Father, if Jesus is not the Messiah, please forgive me. I made a mistake. <laughs> I was scared to death in committing something wrong. You know, just what will my parents say about it? Why other Jewish people don't believe, uh, believe in Jesus? Uh, the major, the, so rabbis don't believe in Jesus. Maybe I'm like a pervert or whatever, just like a crazy, foolish one. So uh, we love to consider the uh, majority. And that's, uh, that's a very significant uh, contra-argument. It's a very significant objection. And it's very legitimate, even uh, like cultural and uh, historic, traditional fear of a Jewish person, considering, even considering Jewish, uh, even only considering uh, Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. Uh, well... The answer to this objection, one of possible answers, could be majority is not necessarily the criteria of the truth. The majority is not always right. The contrary is the case in many situations. Let's consider some passages from the Torah, for example, or a passage. Exodus chapter uh, 23, verse 2. Turn with me to these passages, if or passage, if you would. There is like mitzvah, a commandment. Exodus twenty-three, verse two. You shall not follow a multitude in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute, so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to prevent justice. Don't follow the multitude. It's a mitzvah, it's a commandment. Follow the justice, follow the truth, not the majority. According to the Torah, the majority of rabbis is not the criterion. According to the Torah, the majority of, uh, even overwhelming majority of the Jewish people is not the criterion of truth. It, and it doesn't determine the, what, what is just and right thing to do. Do you remember from the New Testament the passage about uh, Elijah? Uh, uh, Paul quotes the passage, uh, the passage from 1 Kings. Uh, Elijah uh, crying out to God, I'm the only one left. And they're seeking my soul. And God's response is, well, well I got some, uh, several thousand of uh, Jewish people who didn't uh, submit themselves to Baal. So uh, they're still faithful. But do you see the, the feeling of Elijah? I'm alone. I'm so, no, no, I'm so lonely, there is nobody else with me. And to a certain extent, he is right. As the Apostle Paul uh, also mentions, well, it's only the like, 
a remnant for today that follows the, uh, the Lord, as well as back then. So there is always a remnant. According to the divine word, the majority doesn't believe. I mean, it's historically, it's the Torah, it's the Tanakh. The majority is mostly in, in the uh, history of the Jewish people wrong. So don't follow the majority. Besides, do you remember Isaiah 53? Did you read this? Uh, did, uh, uh, have you read this chapter? If you haven't done it yet, read it. It's just only 12 verses that, that can change the life of a Jewish person and also can impact your life. Even if you believe in Jesus, it was written many centuries before Jesus was born. And the gospel story is there. And the main reason for Jesus to die is in Isaiah 53. And in Isaiah 53, we see the resemblance uh, between Jesus and the, uh, and the Jewish people. It's like interchangeable written in the context. Because Jesus is the perfect Jew. Jesus is the perfect Israel. He fulfills the purpose uh, of Israel according to this chapter. But if you read this chapter, what... What is about the majority in this chapter? Do they believe in him? Do you remember this chapter? Just think for a second. Does the majority believe? No. We turn away from him. We, didn't, we disregarded him. We didn't want to know him, etc. Do you remember that? Can you recall it? So the prophecy says... Many years before Jesus came, that the majority of the Jewish people wouldn't believe in him. So for me, when you say that the majority of Jewish people and even rabbis don't believe in Jesus, it's not an objection. It's the support of his messiahship. You see my point? The fact that Jewish people, as my, in their majority or as the whole people don't believe in Jesus yet, it's an argument supporting the fact that he is the Messiah. Because if the Jewish people in their majority would say today, or just even like, like today, oh, we believe in Jesus and Jesus is, it would be probably not necessary the Jesus that was prophesied in Isaiah 53 according and uh, in the story of the gospel. This time is coming because the Isaiah chapter 53 ends with the fact that after his death and after his resurrection, we will embrace him and everybody will. So this time is coming, but not yet. Any questions uh, to this objection? Uh, yes, and uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle Ages, when the Jewish people were pushed and forced by the Christians, or by, by Christian politicians, and at that time state and church were close together, to convert to Christianity, some attempts were very like theologically done. So, you see, the Bible says that Jesus is Christian. And by the way, the Jewish people, uh, for Jewish people, Jesus is Christian. Uh, means, meaning Gentile. So look at this, look at this Jesus. He is prophesied there. Even your Bible says this, the Hebrew Bible. The Jewish rabbis, the big Jewish rabbis like Rashi, they decided to protect the Jewish people against uh, this uh, uh, forceful or theological conversions. And, they, and their uh, like mindset was, Jesus could not be the Messiah, period. And that's why if a prophecy could be understood in the way to point, uh, in pointing to Jesus, it's a wrong interpretation. 
So all the Messianic prophecies, like Isaiah 53 and others, were reinterpreted in the way not to see Jesus there. It was not evil doing. It was not like out of bad motivation. It was the defense. Because at that time, and now notice what I'm, say, uh, what I'm going to say. Jewish no to Jesus became Jewish yes to God. Because for, the, for Jewish people at that time, to believe in this Christian Jesus became uh, equal to breaking the covenantal relationship with the God of Israel. So no to Jesus for the Jewish people became their yes to the God of Israel. You see, um, you see my point? So the rabbis of that time were trying to protect Jewish people uh, from breaking the covenant with God by reinterpreting all the prophecies of the Old Testament that could be f considered even fulf as fulfilled in uh, Jesus. So all prophecies that you will encounter now in Jewish mindset, if they talk uh, about the Messiah, all these prophecies are like, where is the peace? Where is the gathering of the Jewish people? Where is like uh, taking out of all anti-Semitism? Where is things like this? So everything what is left in Jewish mindset that the, as the prophecies of the Messiah is his second coming. <laughs> Why? Because it's not fulfilled yet. And uh, Isaiah 53 used to be Jewish uh, Messianic prophecy. But then it was reinterpreted, as well as many others. So when you quote to the Jewish people prophecies uh, that uh, uh, clearly fulfilled in Jesus, uh, you, uh, you like come to the dead end. Because in their mindset, these prophecies are about anything, but not Jesus. Because it's impossible. Well, uh, that's, this subject is so broad. Uh, and uh, about Messianic prophecies, there are tons of books written. You can, uh, I can recommend you some if you are interested. Uh, other questions in this regard? Did you say Jews see Christ as a Christian and not a Jew? Well, uh, I will make a little bit fun. Uh, but... Uh, just very like culture, uh, culturally determined. Uh, some Jewish people, they might think that Jesus is, a ca is Catholic. <laughs> Why? Because uh, they, uh, when they go like past uh, the Catholic church, uh, very like religious Catholic, uh, Catholic home, there is a woman, uh, like a statue of a woman holding a baby, right? So Mary with uh, baby Jesus, uh, and, uh, and they know that it's like Jesus and his mom in the Catholic Church. So if the mother is Jewish, the baby is Jewish. If the mother is Catholic and she's in the Catholic Church, the baby is Catholic. Well, but it was changed later. I mean, uh, about it's even about the perception uh, right now. So uh, Jesus is, uh, although it's, it's not theologically, it's not like historically that they will say, oh, Jesus is Christian, but it's like embedded in my, in, like, in subconscious. So it's like uh, not for us. Uh, it's like uh, there is another like joke done uh, uh, that uh, John, John the Baptist was Baptist because he is the Baptist, you know? So, <laughs> Southern Baptist problem. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. So, yeah, right. Right. So uh, um, that's uh, that's an, uh, that's some other misconception. So, any other questions regarding the majority that doesn't believe? Okay. The next objection is: Isn't the New Testament anti-Semitic? How? Can we Jewish people come to the idea that the New Testament is anti-Semitic? Well, simply by even reading like the Gospel of John. If you read the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus and his speeches is not nice to Jewish people. Just oh, evil you, evil Jews. If you if you read the uh, if you read the uh, Book of Acts, like Jewish 
people, they always like try to kill Paul and they killed others. And even when, uh, when preached to them, they always try to do, some, to, to do something to harm uh, those believers. And uh, so uh, Jewish people are not nice in the, in, in, uh, in the New Testament. They are presented as not ne necessary uh, nice. Again, um, if you talk, uh, if a Jewish person comes to a church, sits uh, somewhere in the room, and then a Christian preacher, pastor, comes and reads these verses, they know that he is a Gentile. Gentile telling, uh, reading the verses like, oh, you Jews, you are so bad. Just like initial, initial reaction, it's just like, it's anti-Semitic. By the way, do you love Jewish jokes? That's so funny. Don't tell a Jewish joke to a Jew if you're a Gentile. <laughs> you can laugh about that secretly. So read it in the book, laugh, or listen. We Jewish people, we love to tell Jewish jokes to each other. But if, some, if a Gentile will tell me a Jewish joke, it's just like, <laughs> what do you mean by that? Yeah. Because we have this victim mentality. We don't, we, we just like, many of us, if not, if not the majority, we just subconsciously feel that the entire world hates us. So everybody around us who is not Jewish hates me because I'm Jewish. And I know that many can uh, like me or many even that, they don't know that I'm Jewish. Still, just if he's not Jewish, he has or she has something against me. It's like subconscious uh, re, uh, thought that sits uh, very deeply in us. So we cannot take easily a Jewish joke from a Gentile. How much less we can take you evil Jews from a Christian pastor. So the problem is not with the New Testament. The problem is with our perception that the New Testament is the book of Gentiles. Nobody, we just read the uh, Isaiah from chapter 1. Do you remember just bad words? You Jews, you're so, you Israel, you are so evil, you are so bad. Uh, just like, I, I, I hit you so much and I want, to, I want to hit you even more. But nobody ever said that Isaiah is anti-Semite, right? Have you, have you heard any Jew, I, ne I never heard any Jew in my life saying that Isaiah was anti-Semite. Why? Because every Jew knows Isaiah was Jewish. <laughs> so the problem is not with, uh, with the New Testament. The problem is, is, is with our Jewish perception that the New Testament is Christian, meaning not Jewish, Gentile-ish. So to, so to speak. Uh, so what I, uh, what I usually say is uh, New Testament is written by, the Jew, uh, by, uh, by Jewish people and in many ca uh, cases also for the Jewish people. You know, uh, you, it's still debated if Luke, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, if this Luke was a Gentile or a Jew. You know, the arguments that he was a Gentile usually is his Greek name. <coughs> like Luke, uh, Lucas or uh, Luke, uh, well, uh, as well as my name, I'm Jewish, fully Jewish, and my name is Vladimir, it's Slavic name, Not, uh, has nothing to do with being Jewish, uh, as well as Mordechai, do you remember the story of uh, Esther? Mordechai is not Jewish name, it's actually, it's actually sort of like, may the god Marduk ever live, so it's just like, it's a worshipping of false god, but anyway, nobody would say that, this, uh, that, uh, that Mordechai is not Jewish. So uh, at the same time, uh, there is a Luke mentioned uh, among Gentiles in, uh, in Paul in epistles. Well, excuse me, uh, how many Luke, uh, Luke's were there at that time? Why should it be necessary exactly this Luke? But even if it was, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts shows, uh, show that this, uh, their author knew the Jewish lifestyle so well, even better than many Jewish people. So even he, if he was not Jewish by birth, he was like a proselyte, fully belonging and understanding the Jewish uh, lifestyle. So the New Testament is written 
by the Jewish people, by those who understand and loved uh, Jewish people. And also Jewish people are addressed uh, in that. It, uh, the New Testament represents the Jewish culture of that time and is written with love to the Jewish people, emphasizing the glorious future of Israel. Read it carefully. It's there. You can show that uh, to your Jewish friends. It contains also rebuke uh, uh, of the Jewish people for their sin and disobedience. But it is normal for the Jewish mindset and correspond also to the approach of the Old Testament, of the Torah. It's, it was considered as an insider's dialogue. So as Jesus or the apostles were rebuking Jewish people, it was like with Isaiah. Insider, a Jew, is talking to other Jews. It was not the outsider, Gentile or Roman talking. It was a Jew talking to his fellow Jews. So uh, I, would, uh, I would explain that the, uh, the New Testament is a Jewish book with Jewish authors, uh, with uh, much of the Jewish wisdom. Jesus is Jewish. We were talking about that already. And uh, the love for the Jewish people is there in the New Testament. And then... If, uh, if talking to a Jewish person, uh, I know, I've, uh, I um, in many cases ask, have you read the New Testament? And uh, he says, what? New Testament? It's not my book. It's just like it's for the Gentiles. And my response can be also emotional. What? You have never read the bestseller of Jewish literature? You are like educated man. You got to read it. It's the, it's the most published, given out, so, sold, etc. Jewish book ever in the history. In the New Testament, the Jewish, and they're like, really? And you can open the first verse uh, of, uh, of the New Testament, the genealogy of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Really? Any questions in this regard? We will talk more about the words later. I'm using the words like messianic writings. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not ashamed to use the word uh, New Testament. Because it's like uh, going, uh, just touching the uh, thing about uh, the concepts of terminology briefly. Uh, sometimes if I tell uh, to, uh, to a Jewish person, uh, I believe in uh, Yeshua HaMashiach. So, Hebrew. Uh, you know what is the reaction? Eh? <laughs> and then I say, Jesus Christ. Ah! So it's, um, we need to explain what we mean by terminology. So when I, when I say Messianic writings, hmm, okay, what is that? I have no idea, but if you read it, that's okay with you. Uh, so the New Testament is like more familiar concept. So uh, I'm, not, I'm, uh, I'm using the terminology like Jesus and Christ. I'm using the terminology like New Testament. But I always explain what is meant by that. We will briefly deal with that uh, a little bit later. Uh, next objection is, isn't Christianity anti-Semitic? Well, uh, Historically, and even in many contemporary cases, it is unfortunately indeed true. So the Christianity, even in my experience, in many cases is, even today, anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish. Historically, it's certainly true. Now, considering that, please do not try to rationalize or to reason that. So just don't try to say, well, there were many reasons. It's not helpful. Uh, don't try. Don't try to. Uh, don't try to uh, say, you know, those who who did so much harm to the Jewish people uh, in the past, they were not Christian, not Christians. They were like 
nominal Christians. They were Catholics or they were something like that. You know, they were like, don't try even to do that. Because in Jew, to the Jewish eyes and the, in Jewish mindset, they were Christians. I mean, there is no, in Jewish mindset, there is no place for concept like born again Christian. What is just, what is that born again? So Christian or Jewish or just Christian, Jesus, Christian, equal. Uh, just, uh, you put it on the same. Uh, so don't try to explain, oh, those crusaders who killed all Jewish people uh, and burned them alive in the synagogue in Jerusalem, they were, uh, they were not Christians. They were just like whatever or whoever. Uh, no, it, it would not work simply. Historically, it would not work. We, in Jewish mindset, even the Holocaust was, uh, was done by Christians. I mean, all Nazis, they were Christians. Why? Because they were baptized as babies in a Lutheran or Catholic, uh, Catholic churches. So, uh, I, what I would usually recommend is uh, just uh, acknowledge it. Just say that, yes, unfortunately, unfortunately it's true. Many Christians have been, or used to be in history, and even till today, some of them, and maybe even many of them in history, were anti-Semites. And I apologize as the part of the body of the Messiah, as the part of those who call themselves or, uh, or uh, describe themselves or affiliate themselves with as followers of the Messiah, of Jesus. I apologize on the, their behalf for all the harm that was done to the Jewish people in history. And I'm deeply sorry that it happened. But I want to tell you that Jesus is different because he loves Jewish people. Those who were hating uh, or are hating Jewish people even today, they, they are not following example of Jesus and his attitude to the Jewish people. I'm not going to judge them if they are believers or not, born again or not. It's not my business. But I know that if they hate Jewish people, they don't know Jesus as well as they should. And uh, also show that the apostles uh, and the apostles love Jewish people. You can read the passage from Romans chapter 9 verses 1 through 5 that we, were, uh, we read a, a week ago about love of Paul to the Jewish people. You can read the passage from Luke chapter 19 uh, that we read yesterday about uh, last week about Jesus weeping over uh, Jerusalem. Read, uh, read, this, uh, read this passage and show the love of Jesus to the Jewish people. Uh, well, certainly you can mention that not uh, all those who call themselves Christians are believers. Uh, you can rephrase or paraphrase, like tell them uh, the um, story that Jesus once told about those coming to him, telling, uh, in your name we did this and that, and Jesus telling to them, just go away from me, I never knew you. Um, so, uh, yes, not everybody and who called himself or herself Christian in the history, even today, is is follower of Jesus indeed. But, it's, uh, but you can say that probably uh, only attached to your regret about Christian anti-Semitism uh, during the last 2000s of years. Any questions in this regard? Yeah, right. It's a story for its own. Yeah. <laughs> That's correct. Other questions? Well, first of all, I never know anybody so much Jewish. And actually, I watched a movie about how Jewish that, uh, uh, that Jews are German, you know, and the teacher kind of was very sad. And she said that 
thing about how 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 one human can can do that to another human, you know, is just like a, a simple. I mean, to me, I'm just you know, like a, a compassion. You know, in the history, of people go through so much, and just because the the, the evil, you know, uh, people in their power, and they just do that. Um. Right, uh, you're blessed because you never encounter that, uh, you're blessed. You got from him the right feelings and right uh, attitude and you probably were surrounded, in, or you are surrounded by uh, the people who, uh, who have right attitude. So, but it's unfortunately, uh, in my experience even, it's not always the case. I was uh, disinvited by churches even here in Dallas, Fort Worth area, uh, because I'm Jewish, the churches didn't want to have a Jewish guy speaking to them, even just like believing in Jesus, doesn't matter. I heard in my life as a believer, as follower of Yeshua, Jesus, I heard some things I, I couldn't place on the spirituality map <laughs> properly so uh, but may, uh, maybe I met may, uh, because I was traveling so much and met so many Christians spoke in so many churches uh, there are always different uh, attitudes but anyway let's proceed with uh, with objections next objection is I'm concerned about the opinion of my friends family and community that's very significant. Last week we saw that Jewish people are very attached to the family and very attached to the community. So it matters for us, uh, our belonging to the Jewish people. We even like to almost 100%, more, percent, more than 90%, we are proud to be Jewish. So that's an important issue for us, cultural, uh, historic, and traditional. So how about my family? My uh, answer would be, like, there are several different possibil multiple possibilities to answer. My answer would be, uh, do you remember how our nation began? Our forefather, Abraham, do you remember who he was originally? He was a pagan. And the first words that God talk, uh, spoke to him were, go out from your people, from your family, from the place you used to, uh, used to live. Abandon everything what was, uh, what was so dear to you, and I will lead you. So, our, the example of Abraham, if there is a truth, if there is truth, you probably will need to abandon something for that. So, don't, I understand your concern. I value my Jewishness as well. And I, uh, and I love my family and my friends dearly. But in some cases, in the history, even of the beginning of our nation, we had to make some tough decisions. But probably, your parents or your family is not going to abandon you. Not these days, maybe 100 years ago, 50 years ago, but not today. Because they love you. And they will see positive changes in you. I'm talking now to like a virtual uh, Jewish person. And by the way, uh, because I'm, uh, I'm, we're also doing recording and it will be online, uh, it means that there are also possibly some Jewish people who will watch what I'm saying. And to those Jewish people, I want to say, I'm not teaching here the methodology, first of all. I speak my mind, I speak what I feel, and I'm not trying to teach anybody how to trick you as a Jewish person. I try, to, I, no, I try to teach how to point your attention to the fact that the good news is the Jewish good news, first of all, and essentially. And Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And we, are, we should not be afraid of following Yeshua, following Jesus, because he is one of us. History... In the history, we experienced much of harm from, uh, from the side of uh, the church, and there was much injustice done to the Jewish people in the name of Jesus. But I don't want us to disregard the fact that Jesus is the one who essentially came to us as the Jewish people, and also 
to everybody who believes in him and follows him in love. Okay, let's, uh, let's proceed. Uh, theological objections. Theological objections and first of these objections that I'm going uh, to deal tonight is don't Christians believe in three gods while, uh, while Jewish people believe in one? What, uh, what is very also like legitimate uh, objection, you know, the core belief is proclaimed in synagogues and in our homes, in our prayer life is Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Had. Hear Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This oneness of God is the core belief. It's, uh, it's not, com it's not compromisable, compromisable belief. It's what we build our faith and life uh, upon if we believe in this one God. As we uh, saw a week ago, uh, the majority of the Jewish people don't really believe in existence of a personal one God. But uh, when, uh, while talking to my fellow Jewish person, uh, I usually ask, uh, ask a question. Okay, now, what do you mean by saying that God is one? What do you mean by that? How one is God? In what way? I have never heard uh, a legitimate description. You know, uh, you can compare God just, he is one as this bottle. But it would be wrong, because God is, God is not a bottle. You can compare God with, uh, like, uh, with one finger, but God is not a finger. How would you describe God as one? There is no uh, legitimate biblical way to do that. And if you consider that the Torah prohibits to compare God or create an image of God, in any way. So you cannot describe God as the bottle. You see the point? Like 100 years ago, a little bit more, some Jewish scholars were saying that God is one as an atom. Uh, atom, atom. Uh, because he, uh, because it, uh, God cannot be split as atom. Well, surprise came a few years later. <laughs> It can be split. It. So that's that's why that's why don't compare God with ever with with anything. Can you imagine even like among Christians how many weird comparisons and pictures we uh, we are making, like God in geometry triangle. God is not triangle. Excuse me. Or God on a farm, like an egg, you know, like uh, yellow, white, and then shawl. So, excuse me, God is not an egg. <laughs> or God in a bakery, like a bratzel. God is not a bratzel. <laughs> Even crazier illustration, God in a shower, you know, like shampoo, conditioner, and the uh, shower. Uh, and, and so. so God is like not shampoo, you know. And then, and then, actually, another crazy one is like, God is like water, ice, and vapor. That's a heresy. It's, the church rejected that long ago. It's called modalism. And still, Christian, some Christian preachers teach it. Horrible. Just, I would encourage everybody to stop doing that because it's pagan. It's unbiblical. It's actually anti-biblical, in fact. So we Christians stop to, com to compare God with, uh, or try to uh, compare God with anything or, try, uh, or trying to make a picture of him. It's not legitimate. It's prohibited, actually. And we as Jewish people, we got to stop describing God as one whatever, because we cannot rationalize God. We cannot describe him and our head, just like our mind is not big enough to comprehend him in like rational worldly terms and illustrations that we can, uh, that we can use. 
So we, we cannot compare God with anything in this universe. And we need to admit, uh, oneness of God is a mystery. It's like uh, this, uh, this word echad, one, can, mean, uh, can have very many different meanings. I mean, the language, the Hebrew language is very poor language. I mean, vocabulary-wise, poor language. Because the stem of Hebrew word is only three letters. Right? And how many letters are there in Hebrew alphabet? Some of you should know that. 22. Can you imagine, like, three combina three com like, uh, three combina like, three ro uh, letters root? of 22 letters. How many words you can create out of that? Not many. <laughs> you can calculate it later. Uh, but the vocabulary, Hebrew vocabulary is very poor. So one word can, mean, can have many different meanings. And you can determine meaning by a context and by combination, with combining it with other words and phrases. So one word can, mean many, uh, can have very many different meanings. So the word ehad can mean one as a number, one as a battle, one as composition of, uh, of many other things. So there are many different meanings. But uh, you, know, uh, you know what? Uh, some interesting passages for you to consider. God creating, created man in his own image, right? And in the same passage is written, man Oh, and woman, so male and female, he created them. Man, singular, created in his image. Male and female, he created them. So it's just like two in one, one that consists of two. It's the, it's the God's image in, uh, in man. And then, and then in, uh, in, chapter, in, chapters, uh, in chapter three, uh, the, like the... Uh, Pivotal, just like the top of the creation, it's all like finished. It's written, the man will leave his parents and will cleave to his wife, and they both will become one flesh, flesh a heart. Now, and this statement is universal for all times. What it, what it means? My wife and I, we are... One flesh. I'm not talking one spirit or one soul, what would be nice. <laughs> it's written one flesh. My wife and I, one flesh? If you have spouses, how, how is it possible? Oh, it's a mystery. That's a divine, a hard mystery. And if you remember in the Bible, sometimes the marriage is an image of God. So how many are there? One in two, two as one, not here. Am Israel goy echad, we proclaim it as Jewish people. The people of Israel are one people. And as one people, we represent God in this, wor uh, in this world, as echad. The same word is use, uh, used for that. I'm not trying to tell you that you can, with, uh, you can co convince a Jewish person by just lexical anal uh, analysis of the word Ehad, because this word can mean many different things. But there is a legitimate open door for God to be three in one. And also, as Jesus was praying in, uh, in John chapter 17, uh, about uh, just for his disciples and for unity of his disciples. Hopefully, some of you can recall this passage. He was, pre uh, he was praying, Father, make them one, the disciples, for the world to see that you, Father, and I are one. So the oneness of God, of Father and Jesus, should be seen in the unity of the church, in the unity of the husband and wife, in the unity of Israel. You know why it's so difficult today to, uh, to explain people the 
trinity or triunity, and even to show that to the Jewish people, because the church is not one. Because the marriage, a good marriage, is not, is not like absolutely common thing. Because the people of Israel are very diverse and divided also among uh, each other. So the unity, the God as one in his unity is a divinity of the Son and the Holy Spirit as well as the Father should be seen in many mysterious things as the body of the Messiah, what is usually called the church, in the people of Israel and in the healthy marriage. Uh, the Jewish tradition, the mystical Jewish tradition, uh, tends, to, uh, tends to see the mystery of God. Even in Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, like uh, the Kabbalistic tradition, a Kabbalistic tradition interprets uh, this passage like, Shema Yisrael, hero Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one, three in one. Again, I don't, uh, I don't uh, argue that you can bring this passage and tell to a Jewish person, you see this, uh, there is a Jewish tradition that teaches that, and this tradition is true. Well, a few, uh, few passages later, the same tradition could deny it, because, uh, you know, uh, Jewish, two Jews, three opinions. Anyway, uh, but there is something embedded in our, uh, in our mind that God lives in his beautiful mystery that cannot be comprehended. Even as Moses asked God, uh, asked God about seeing him, he saw only like in the Torah it's written, like his back, but not like really um, muscle back <laughs> of, uh, of a bodybuilder. No, he, uh, he, saw, uh, he saw God in his character as forgiving, loving, but also just uh, and uh, righteous. Uh, the one who forgives and the one who, uh, who punish uh, for the sin. So what we can know about God is more about his character and about what he is doing, not about his very essence and his very existence in eternity. And that's why God said, be holy as I am holy, do like I do, be uh, in life or, uh, or live like I live, but don't necessarily be <laughs> the same nature as I am. Uh, any questions in this regard? It to, uh, I took more time for this objection because it's, uh, I think it's a very uh, important one. Any questions? Here there is three gods in the talking about uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, correct. It's, uh, it's what uh, Jewish people uh, understand by Christian belief of Trinity. It's like three gods. But if you look at uh, like uh, old icons or what, what is represented in the churches, it's like uh, old, uh, old like Santa Claus type uh, God uh, with beard. Uh, and there is like uh, a baby sometimes uh, uh, on his lap and uh, there is a dove somewhere flying around. So uh, there are three on picture. Uh, on this picture. So the, uh, the church pictures, uh, in many cases, they don't represent the mystery of God. They don't represent his oneness so clearly as his uh, three. So they, uh, they don't represent three uh, in one as one so uh, vividly as they represent, historically represent the three. So um, Jesus is divine. The Holy Spirit is divine and also per, uh, uh, person. And Father is divine as well. And it's one God. How does it exist? No idea. It's a mystery. Uh, I can have some explanations to that. Uh, and I, I certainly respect some theologians who came up with some uh, expectations. But that's something what I would probably completely understand only when I see him face to face. Uh, in uh, the future. No, understand, will fully comprehend when I see him face uh, to face with it. And now it's a matter of belief. So it's, uh, it doesn't contradict to uh, the Jewish mindset necessary uh, so much because even in the Talmud 
we see expectations that the Messiah uh, should be pre-existent and uh, things uh, like that. So just, um, I would also probably not start by describe, uh, by uh, explaining the divinity of Jesus to a Jewish person or to any unbeliever because it's, uh, mysteries are probably more to those who already walk by the Spirit of God, you know. So it's, uh, it requires a little bit more spiritual exercise. Uh, although I can, uh, I can see it for hours and from different passages, even from the Old Testament as well as in the rabbinic tradition, uh, showing uh, to the Jewish person that it's possible, still uh, I cannot expect a Jewish person or even a Gentile to comprehend, understand, or by knowledge accept uh, this. Because it's, we need to be humble in this regard. It's something what the Spirit of God tells to our spirit. Okay, any other questions? The virgin, the next objection, the virgin birth is not possible. Well, it's very simple theology. Is God Almighty? Yes. <laughs> he can do whatever. <laughs> he can do everything. Now, are you Jewish? Yes, I am. Do you remember how our nation began? By a supernatural birth. Sarah, she was not able to give a birth any longer. It's clearly stated in the Torah. She passed the age. And everything what was like indicating that she can give a birth to a child was not there any longer. So physically, biological, it was not possible. The Torah is pretty clear about that. And that's why Sarah laughed. I should have a child. <laughs> it's not possible. And one year later, Isaac, uh, Isaac is there. So our nation began by supernatural birth. So now, are you Jewish? Yes, I am. So you should believe in, uh, that it's possible for God uh, uh, like, to make a virgin pregnant. Any questions to this regard? By the way, a passage that I quoted from, uh, from Genesis, uh, you can take a note of this passage, Genesis chapter 18, verses 10 uh, through 14. So Genesis 18, 10 through 14. Next objection. Man cannot become God. Amen. <laughs> Man cannot. <laughs> But God can come as a man because he is almighty. And I usually give an example uh, that uh, years ago my friend, also a messianic leader, told me about uh, uh, a rabbi who was bringing his disciples, an orthodox rabbi who, were, who was bringing his disciples to my friend, a messianic uh, Jewish believer, uh, to debate with him for his disciples to see how he can defeat a messianic uh, leader or a, or a Jewish believer. So this question came up. So God cannot uh, become a man. And my friend said, but man can come, uh, but uh, God can, uh, so, sorry, man cannot become God. But my, uh, my, uh, my friend said, yeah, um, yes, it's true, but God can come as a man. And the Orthodox rabbi said, no, he can't. And then immediately he covered his mouth. He stood up and left the room because he committed a very significant sin. <laughs> he, just, uh, he just humiliated God by saying that he, there is something what he cannot do. So theologically, the, uh, the argument that God can come as a man, yes, clearly he can. 
Any questions in this regard? Yes. A quick follow up with that. Um, some of the prophets do say that certain things God can't do, like he can't lie. So that wouldn't be a uh, something to, that would desecrate God's character to say that he couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so unlike, say, Islam, Judaism doesn't have qualms about God being able to do certain things when it comes to the physical world. Because I know that when it comes to Islam, you, Muslims seem to have a bigger barrier to God doing certain things that they think God becoming a man is very demeaning of God. But that wouldn't necessarily be a rejection of Judaism? Uh, no, because God was uh, like quote-unquote taking form of different things or okay. talking through different thing, uh, things like uh, from the born and burning bush okay. or uh, in pillar of fire or, uh, or, or dust. So he was, God can do whatever he wants, <laughs> actually. So it's not, uh, uh, and suddenly, uh, suddenly it was very humiliating for God or the, for the son of God or for, uh, the word of God to come and to become a flesh. And you remember this passage uh, from uh, Philippians chapter 2. He took a form of a slave. Yes, it was humiliation of God on our behalf. He, he, was, uh, he was in submission and humiliation through his very death for us to be saved. And because of that, God raised him above all. So that's, uh, that's a theological concept by itself. OK, um, yes, please. <clears throat> So uh, I please uh, explain it. Uh, like because like God has no limits. I mean, like mm -hmm. I, I feel like um, I don't know. I could be wrong about this, but like why like I don't understand how God can put himself like put a limit on himself that way. He certain God certainly can. Uh, he is unlimited, but he can limit himself. Mm -hmm. It's his. It can be his decision. For example. Uh, in the Bible, it's written like even like uh, the Solomon was saying, like heaven and heavens of heaven are not big enough for God. And you decided to live in this temple. So God could limit his presence by, uh, by the holy of holies of the temple, according to the Bible. So uh, it's uh, coming uh, in flesh. In case of Yeshua, Jesus was not the first time God limited himself in the history. But it was the most significant and uh, redeeming one. Uh, next objection is we no longer need a sacrifice. Uh, well, blood was given as a necessary tool according to the Torah. If you would please... Uh, Open with me, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the, uh, of the life that makes atonement. And it's a very old, also a Jewish idea. I mean, not as old as the Torah, but even in the rabbinic uh, discussion, we find the idea that in order, uh, so life has to be paid for life. So something needs to be, uh, like the justice has to be done. So, for an in order to atone for something, life to ne uh, needs to be brought as a sacrifice. And that's why blood, because blood uh, is something what, uh, what moves in the body when the body is alive. So no movement of blood, no blood, no life. And uh, according to the like, visual society of that time, movie blood is life. 
So what is living, like uh, living in the body? Blood, so because it makes uh, uh, a corpse <laughs> alive. So that's, uh, that's the idea of, uh, of the atonement. So blood is needed. Uh, if you take uh, the sacrifice, a sacrificial system out of the Torah, there is no much left. Because when you read the books of the Torah, it's to the most part around the temple and the sacrificial system. So take it out, um, there is not much left of the Torah. We do need blood if we tell that we do need the Torah. W but you see, Jewish people don't have uh, the temple for about 2,000 years. Yes, it's a good argument. Probably there is another sacrifice was <laughs> done. Maybe some, something uh, related to the blood was also uh, uh, given. Uh, and uh, the fact that we are so, uh, so many years without the temple, even by the Jewish tradition, it's, uh, it's not considered as a blessing. It's punishment. It's a disadvantage. It's very unfortunate. So there should be something. And uh, there is, uh, even the Talmud, even the rabbinic tradition says that uh, 40 years, about 40 years before the destruction of the Second Temple, God stopped receiving the sacrifices for the Day of Atonement. And it's approximately at the time as uh, Yeshua, Jesus died on, uh, on the cross, the perfect sacrifice was brought. And even, again, I'm emphasizing, even the rabbinic tradition says, since that year, God never uh, re accepted the, of, uh, the sacrifice for the Day of Atonement. And how he didn't do that, it usually was a sign that he accepts. There was like, uh, like a special thing that was turning white instead of being red, so it ceased uh, changing the color. And the Jewish tradition, the, the rabbis of old, they were complaining to God that it happened. So God actually uh, gave us something different instead. And it's, it's Yeshua, Jesus. The temple service was instituted for sacrifices. If we are talking about temple in Jerusalem without sacrifices, not much meaning. Uh, there is no one biblical in indication in the Old Testament that God has modified the, uh, the necessity of the sacrifice or blood for the sacrifice. And you can quote Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant. Well, it's, it's a, very bi a very big subject. A any questions? Yes. Um, I did get into a discussion with Jewish friend about this question. He particularly brought the issue of forgiveness, like why would somebody else, why can't I pay for my own sins? And how would you answer that objection? Um, well, uh, God never expected uh, so God expected you to pay for your sin. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, because he loves you, he, all, he, uh, he ordained, uh, he talked about temple and about sacrifices, even in the Torah. Somebody got to die on your place. That's the core of the Torah, actually. Uh, so... If you, want to, if you want to bear the consequences and you want to pay for your sin, you're welcome to do that. But from the God's <coughs> standpoint, you must not. Because there is a sacrifice. There was a sacrifice and there is a sacrifice. But if, you want, if you're a little bit masochistic and want to, to suffer, so... You're welcome to do so. Uh, but, but again, it, you need to have a little bit sense of humor talking to Jewish people, if debating, because we, when we're debating and arguing, uh, it's always with, uh, it should be done partially with a sense of humor as well. Okay. Yeah. They say, mm -hmm. 
They say uh, usually the Jewish tradition says that uh, the prayer replaces the sacrifice. So, uh, and there are some biblical passages uh, uh, that can be used uh, that are used as support of that. So the, uh, even the Jewish prayers, and we are going to talk about that uh, next week, about Jewish traditions and holidays. Uh, even some Jewish, uh, pr uh, even Jewish prayers, communal Jewish prayers or community prayers, they resemble the sacri uh, sacrifices in the temple, like morning, afternoon, and uh, evening sacrifices. And uh, the prayer of repentance, uh, the, uh, the reading uh, that of the temple service, uh, about the temple service, and things like that. By saying that, you like doing that. It's, it's very old, actually, uh, biblical and Jewish idea that uh, the word is a deed. So it's like, again, Hebrew language, the word and deed is the same word in Hebrew. It can be the same word, like davar. So it's, uh, it can be work, it can be, uh, it, it can be work. A word. So uh, even in the New Testament, we, uh, we find evidence. Don't curse, for example, but bless. So you say something, it works. So your words, they work. It's like God, he said, and it was done just by saying. So uh, there is a, it's like a word of meaning play in all this. So by saying prayer, you are like implying the sacrifice. So by saying prayer, you are like bringing the blood uh, that covers you. Well, so far so good, but uh, it's not directly what is written in the Torah. Again, I'm saying there is no passage in the Old Testament that clearly says that anything will compromise, abolish, or diminish the meaning of the sacrifice. Nothing. So it's like uh, it, uh, the argumentation for prayer is more like an excuse than a legitimate uh, reason. Okay, next objection is, uh, if Jesus was the Messiah, where is, uh, why is there no peace? Well, that's, uh, that's very common, the logical objection. Is it not written that the Messiah will, uh, will establish, uh, establish peace? It's a very challenging question. Uh, yes, we need to admit it. Many passages in the Old Testament tell us that in the eschaton and in the messianic age there will be peace so <laughs> it's not fulfilled yet uh, listen it's just like and it's it's very it's very legitimate and tough question if he is the one where is the peace the, then uh, just i would humbly respond uh, Jesus came the first time to suffer and to die for our sin. In his second coming, he is going to install the universal peace and the kingdom for Israel. Someone would respond, why would he need to come too? Exactly, exactly. And that's, and that's, uh, and that's the next question, <laughs> the next objection on our list. The Messiah is coming once, not twice. According to the Jewish tradition, uh, well, uh, yes and no. Uh, because even the Jewish tradition speaks of two messiahs sometimes. Like the Mash uh, Mashiach ben Yosef, the Messiah son of Joseph, and Mashiach ben Davi David, the Messiah son of David. The, Mashiach, uh, the Messiah son of Joseph, it's not the Joseph that was uh, considered the father of Jesus or husband of uh, Miriam, Mary. It's the Joseph, the son of Jacob, the one who was sold to Egypt and was considered dead, suffered, but, was, uh, but kept righteousness and then saved his family and said to his brothers, these are not you who sent me here. But God sent me here in order to save, uh, to save you. So the Jewish tradition sees, uh, in, some, in, in, in some passages at least, Joseph, that Joseph, as the prototype of the Messiah, or like a Messiah, uh, and prototype for the Messiah who comes to suffer and to be killed. Even the rabbinic tradition says uh, this. 
and Mashiach ben David, uh, Messiah, son of David, is the glorious uh, conquering Messiah, the one who rules like the king, the victorious one. So the, the Jewish tradition speaks uh, of these uh, two messiahs. Now, uh, what, the Bible, <laughs> what does the Bible say about the two messiahs? Uh, let's turn now to uh, Isaiah 53, chapter, uh, no, Isaiah chapter 53. And let's read verses 10 through 12. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. What can we see in this passage? In the whole passage of the suffering servant. So we see the one who suffers, dies, but later rules. Can you see it in this passage? So it's like suffering, Death, ruling. So this is the suffering Messiah who is ruling afterwards. Now compare it with uh, the passage of uh, Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10. And here in this passage, and even Jewish tradition admits it because it's clearly, it's clearly not so evidently about Jesus. Uh, it's about the, the Messiah coming as the king. So God is coming to rescue his people. So every nation is against Israel. Even Jewish people are against each other. And it's a great distress and great affliction. And God is intervening. So he, the, he comes to rescue his people and to establish his kingdom in Israel and to, this, uh, to establish this peace. And in uh, Zechariah chapter 12, we read about his coming. And it's written, And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him, like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. So, here we see the king, like the Messiah, son of David, coming, but at the same time, we see he was suffering before. He was pierced. So, in this passage, the king Messiah is coming, but previously, he was suffering. In Isaiah 53, we see the suffering Messiah who will be victorious. Now, two Messiahs? No. One Messiah coming twice. For me, it's more plausible. It's not just two different Messiahs. Suffering and, uh, and uh, then gloriously ruling. And then gloriously ruling but then, uh, but before suffering, I think it's a match. So I, you know, I would use this uh, argumentation as an example. So yes, we're not there yet. It's still going to be fulfilled in the future. 
But the foundation for the future is laid down. Because the covenant, the new covenant with our people, Israel, and I'm talking to my fellow Jewish person, this covenant, the new covenant is already cut, already sealed, is already paid for with uh, the blood and sacrifice of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Messiah. Everything is getting ready for his second coming. The peace is approaching. It's a good time to make a decision. <laughs> Any questions in this regard? Uh, can I add something to this? Uh, the peace part. Um, in synagogues, they don't always literally interpret Bible, but sometimes um, literally, not literally. And uh, for example, what the peace part, what I was thinking about that, um, like when we think peace, we think of the external peace, but um, when we, if, you, if we don't interpret literally, um, but there's like four ways to interpret Bible, like different, and one of them is uh, looking through like piece of the heart that he gave us, and then something that he did fulfill it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. He gives peace. Uh, uh, we are way more peaceful than we would be without him. He is our comfort. And he, he gives us comfort. He calms down our like disturbed soul. There is stand, yeah, absolutely. But it's not something what you can argue directly as response to this objection. Because for, uh, for the Jewish people, salvation uh, is not a matter just like I'm saved from something. If there is salvation, there had to be a tr some trouble. So it's, it's, uh, you are saved from a real trouble. So what was the trouble? And uh, the, uh, the piece that is meant here is primarily um, like, external. yes, external world peace or well-being of Jewish community uh, in many cases. Uh, why don't Christians keep the Torah? I will let you to answer this question <laughs> because there are different, too many different approaches and uh, two different pers and different perspectives on that. Uh, and uh, it's probably like a theology class, systematic theology class on its own uh, in this regard. So just uh, I will keep it as an open question <laughs> for you. Uh, but uh, you can say that you at least even if you like. Uh, you can always say that uh, I respect uh, the Torah and the Torah is a precious gift that was given uh, to the Jewish people. And also you can mention that Jesus is the crown over the Torah. He is the perfect Torah. He is uh, incarnate, incarnated Torah, so to speak. He is the word of God uh, uh, that came in flesh. So he is the fullness of the Torah. He is the giver of the Torah. Po just direct everything back to, to the one who is over all and to his Messiah, Yeshua. Uh, that's, uh, that's probably the key. And then if you want to explain uh, how you eat and what you celebrate, it's, I will leave it as an open question for you at the moment. Uh, emotional objections. And now emotional objections it's not something what we uh, what needs to be too uh, like too much theologized about it's not like a curious mind it's not tradition it's not it's just like it's more like emotion and uh, and uh, the emotional objections are uh, like you christians think that you are only ones who know the truth well uh, Yes, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, well, uh, I, would, um, I would usually uh, tell to anybody that I'm on a journey. I'm, uh, I'm on a journey uh, following the truth. So I do believe that, uh, that Yeshua, Jesus, is truth. He changed my life. I can't compromise this experience. I see the wisdom uh, for, and support for all of this uh, in the Bible. So. Uh, that's the truth for me, but my journey never stops. You can, uh, you could see last week, Jewish people. We usually, uh, we, uh, we, we have a curious mind, so we question things. We want, uh, we never stop learning, so to speak. So I'm also on a journey. I want to learn more. So join me on this journey. I will tell to my Jewish friend. 
So let's discover the truth together. You bring your arguments, I will bring mine. Let's talk about it. It's not that I'm the, the, the smartest uh, uh, in the neighborhood. No, not necessary. Let's find both of us on this journey. Let's talk about this. So it's emotional objection. It needs an emotional <laughs> response. <laughs> or just like honest and humble, but not necessary, uh, not necessary <laughs> clearly biblical explanation in this case. Right. Uh, again, theologically, that's, uh, that might be true, but it's an emotional question. It's more, it's more about you to, uh, to show that you, are not, that you are not pretending to be the smartest, the wisest, uh, and the most uh, knowledgeable, uh, or just uh, elevating the Christianity, and now Christianity as non-Jewish religion, quote-unquote, over Jewish people and over uh, Judaism. So you're not trying to, uh, to show the glorious church over the blinded synagogue. Uh, what the Christians did uh, for centuries, if not for thousands of years. So that's, uh, that's emotional, uh, it requires emotionally humble response. So the next objection, the Holocaust, how could God allow it? That's, that's probably the toughest emotional question. Uh, be ready. Some Jewish people, uh, they would even not so much concerned about the Holocaust, but they would bring this objection or this emotional reaction anyway. Just because it's so deeply embedded in our culture, uh, as we could see last week uh, in the survey. 70, more than 70% of the Jewish people, what does it mean to be Jewish? Remembering the Holocaust is the answer. So just uh, this question will in many cases uh, come up. Particularly after the Holocaust, many rabbis and many Jewish scholars uh, decided that God, there is no God. Because if God would be there, he would never let it happen. So some even wrote books like God is dead or something, uh, something like this. So God died, God died for Jewish people. Uh, so in Jewish mind, God died uh, in the Holocaust. Uh, some people can get more emotional of, uh, about that, some less. But disregarding all this, you know, that's a trauma. And, uh, how, and, emotional, uh, and emotional question. When you see people with trauma, how, uh, how do you respond? Do you try to rationalize? No. Do you try uh, to come up with, uh, with explanation? Like, for example, oh, your son died because of, uh, he, uh, he was uh, driving drunk uh, and he crashed. You see, it's because of his sin, drinking too much, that's why he died. Would you tell to his mother these words? Never. It's, it's insane. So in talking to Jewish people, you suddenly can, could, could start theologizing that. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 28 speaks about that it's, uh, if, in case of your disobedience. Or Leviticus chapter 26. Don't do that. Maybe it's, it's part of the truth. But nobody cares about this stuff if somebody is tra uh, traumatized uh, by, uh, by something. You can say, you know, God was punishing Nazis for doing that. He, they were evil and they are punished. Again, it's not what, uh, what you first of all uh, here to do. You just take the hand, sort of like, I, it's like an illustration. You take a hand of your Jewish friend and you, uh, you, you, you may say something like, I'm so deeply sorry that it happened. I'm so... I'm just so sorry. I just, let me sit with you. It's like uh, when somebody dies in a Jewish family, they sit Shiva, we are going to talk about that uh, next week. But it's just like sitting together. Just compassion. I'm sorry. 
And, uh, and some Jewish people would suddenly notice that you care about them even more than they do. And it would be a very touchy, very sensitive, very big surprise to, uh, to them. And also, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can tell uh, them that uh, I think that Jesus was suffering, seeing Jewish people suffering during the Holocaust. You might ask where Jesus was during the Holocaust. I will tell you. He was in concentration camp. He was in a gas chamber with his people because he is part of the Jewish people. God was suffering, and in certain sense, he was dying with his people during the Holocaust. God was not completely dead, but he was dying. He was, he, he was, they were killing him as God, in God's chambers. They caused a tremendous pain to God by harming the Jewish people. So it's an emotional question. It allows an emotional uh, response of compassion, love, and understanding. Can you say a movie? <coughs> the yes, uh, it's right. <laughs> there, are, there are a number of movies uh, made about that. Yeah, and yeah. Well, uh, any questions in this regard? Next, uh, next, uh, next objection is, what about, my, uh, what about my righteous ancestors who have died? And we Jewish people, we're probably like champions of having uh, uh, righteous grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's like our head, like family memory. Our grandparents, even if they were not so... Good. Still, in our memory, they're just the best. <laughs> so, uh, so my grandfather, you, may, you, you want to say that my grandfather, the tzaddik, the righteous one, uh, who attended the synagogue regularly and were fasting for Yom Kippur, that he is burning in hell because he didn't believe in Jesus? Well, again, it's an emotional, uh, it's an emotional uh, answer. Not, uh, not necessary uh, much for theology. You, uh, you can say, first of all, like, I have no idea where your grandfather is right now. I'm not, I'm not a judge, and uh, I, I, have no, I have no idea uh, whether he believed in Jesus or not or whatever. So don't even ask me this question. I cannot give you any answer. I simply don't know. But at the same time, please take a note that the Torah says that there is, a, and the Bible says, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, there is a different destiny for uh, or the different future for different people regarding uh, or real, uh, as related to their lifestyle. Even in the prophet, uh, by the prophet, uh, in the book of Daniel, it's written that there will be a resurrection and some will be risen for the eternal life, and some will be reason for the eternal punishment. So, there is a warning in the Bible. So, let's talk about you, not about uh, your grandfather. And uh, let me tell you a very interesting Haggadah story, so Jewish telling story, that was told by Rabbi Jesus. <laughs> And the, uh, and the story is uh, about uh, Lazarus and the rich man. Do you remember this story from the Bible? So you can tell it with your words. There were two men, rich man and, uh, and poor Lazarus. Uh, and uh, they died. And Lazarus came to the nice place to sit with Abraham. And the rich man landed in a bad place. He suffered. And then the rich man saw Lazarus just enjoying his life with Abraham. And the rich man said, Oh, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my brothers. 
for my brothers, for my family to, uh, to see that, uh, to be warned, not to come to this bad place. And Abraham said, there is a big gap. <laughs> we are not going back and forth so easily. And uh, also, uh, even if somebody would come, would be risen from the dead and come to your brothers, it would change nothing. They have the Torah and the prophets. They know what to do. The, reason, the, the point of this story in this regard is, do you know why I am talking with you right now? Maybe your righteous grandfather asked Abraham <laughs> to send me your way. Because he, disregarding on where he is located right now, he cares about you. He wants you to be in a good place. So let's stop talking about your grandfather and let us talk about you and your destiny. Any questions in this regard? Another objection, objection is, I was born this way, it is too late for me to change my worldview. Uh, it's emotional, it's maybe legitimate, but it's not Jewish. Our father Abraham, 75 years old, left, this, uh, left his uh, country, became a fully believer only about almost like 100 years old. Our Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, how old was he as he met God for the first time? 80. So, it's never too late. You're never too old to consider, uh, to consider a new life, following your God <laughs> who loves you. Emotional question, emotional answer. Any questions in this regard? Next objection. Christianity is relatively new. Judaism is an old, very <laughs> old and ancient uh, religion. Yes, but do you know, my friend, that Christianity is Jewish? Did we talk about that already? It was a Jewish sect. <laughs> it started as a Jewish religious <laughs> movement. So, what we what we understand by following Yeshua, Jesus, is built upon the Jewish foundation, upon the origin, like upon the foundation of the Judaism, as uh, it was uh, back then. The ways, as we talked, were depa departed. Departed ways of church and Judaism. But let, but let, me, t let me tell you, now the ways the paths are coming together again. Something very significant is going on in the world. The church is recognizing Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. And the church starts to recognize her Jewish roots and Jewish background. And the Jewish people are approaching Jesus as their redeemer and savior and Messiah in larger and larger numbers. So just join the movement. Be part of this glorious season approaching the Messiah's second coming. Uh, no, I cannot, I cannot say uh, this way, because uh, after Jesus, it was still Judaism. <laughs> okay. Even in the book of Acts, it was Juda uh, Judaism. Uh, even in, the, in Pauline, uh, Pauline epistles, it was uh, still considered as a Jewish uh, religious uh, movement. Uh, so it's not, it was not designed as a completely... By God, it was not designed originally as a completely different and new religion. It was designed by God as fullness that Israel and all nations were, and the whole creation, I would say, were longing for. You see, it's not about making a new religion. 
It's bringing down to earth the fullness that all creation was longing for, Jews and Gentiles. So it's just like you say, it's a foundation. Well, it's built, uh, it's built, uh, it's built upon Jewish roots. Yeah. And, uh, and as we uh, talked briefly last week, uh, Christians are grafted in uh, into the stem of Israel with patriarchs as roots. Anyway, um, let, me, uh, let me briefly talk about the terminology. As I mentioned uh, to you earlier, uh, terminology is not so uh, as important as your explanation. Uh, don't talk words, talk concepts. If you talk about salvation, explain what you mean. If you talk about sin, explain what you mean. If you talk about judgment, explain what you mean. Don't assume that everybody understands our theological jargon. We use the terminology that we assume everybody understands. No way. Uh, it's just like, uh, just imagine a secular person who never been to a church before, coming to your church and, the, and, the song, and listening to the songs like, uh, by the blood of the lamb, we were, our sin is washed clean. It's just like, <laughs> I worship you, lion. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's strange. So don't never assume that people you are talking to, especially Jewish people or secular people, they understand your theological or church terminology. It's not necessarily the case. It's not necessarily should be the case. But anyway, some, uh, some examples. You can, uh, in, uh, you can talk about Mashiach or Messiah, but also explain that it's somebody who, uh, who Christians uh, uh, call as Christ, uh, so like anointed one. Uh, and uh, please make sure that Jewish people you're talking to, they don't think that Christ is the last name. Like, uh, it's like Jesus uh, J. Christ. It's not. <laughs> so it's not his last name, okay? Uh, so with Jesus, Yeshua, you can say that uh, it's like God saves or God's salvation, so related to this. So try to explain everything. Uh, instead of using the word Christian, so you will become a Christian. Uh, instead of this, just follow Yeshua, become his follower. Uh, be the one who belongs to him and uh, dwells with him. Uh, converted Jew, <laughs> that's <laughs> horrible. It's just like because in, in Jewish mindset, con you're converting from uh, it, you're convert converting not to something, but from something. So converted Jew is somebody who abandoned his people and came uh, to be somebody completely, uh, completely different. So I'm converted from Judaism. Don't use this uh, word, please. So believing. Uh, or Yeshua, uh, Jewish Yeshua follower, or disciple of, uh, of the Messiah. Different words, but not convert, uh, converted Jew, because it's, it's not good. Instead of the word church, uh, I would suggest uh, use, uh, using word of the congregation, because it's actually what, or community, even better, because that's what uh, biblic uh, biblically, what later was called uh, uh, church, uh, in original sense mean it's like a community of uh, believers that are called to be with him and surrounded in the name of the messiah uh, uh, when you talk about like cross um, you can better talk about the death of the messiah so don't don't uh, wake the image of the crucifix in their uh, in their mind because again it's very uh, un not jewish thing to do <laughs> Uh, Trinity, probably uh, talk about like unity of God or triune God. I mean, if uh, talking of terminology. Uh, so atonement, you can talk about forgiveness. Uh, so instead of like, yeah, so talk about uh, sacrifice, forgiveness. 
Uh, Old Testament is unfortunate terminology you can use instead like Hebrew Bible uh, or Tanakh. Uh, blood, of blood of the Lamb, <laughs> just strange terminology maybe for the Jewish uh, people, use the sacrifice of the Messiah. Well, explain it. Even like, don't follow precisely the suggestions that I make. Use your terminology, explain it in the words for people to understand. Consider that just some suggestions or, or example, examples. Uh, uh, repentance, uh, yes, but also talk in terms of tshuva, return, return to God. So we left astray, we went uh, on our own ways, and now it's the time to return. It's like prodigal son. We went away from God, and now we're returning, and Jesus is the way for us to return. So we, uh, in Jewish mindset, we talk more about return, shuva. Uh, baptism, uh, there, is, uh, there is a parallel in, Ju so bap uh, in Judaism, and origin of the baptism is Jewish mikveh, so like ritual uh, baths uh, in, uh, in Jewish centers or in synagogues, uh, and it's done usually by immersion there. So you can talk about mikveh, uh, you can talk about tvila. It's called, there is a special uh, custom of tvila going into the water. Uh, born again, <laughs> uh, describe it with different words, like uh, st uh, starting new life, or joining uh, the family of the Messiah or the community of uh, the Messiah, like uh, returning to God. So uh, getting just like being, even you can say like being filled with his spirit or just Ruach HaKodesh uh, moves us as he was doing with the prophets. Just use different things, but don't assume that they understand what means born again uh, in your terminology. Because in Jewish, it, it's a subject for its own, but in Jewish mindset and rabbinic tradition, uh, being born again uh, means something completely different. Anyway, or slightly different. Uh, yeah, saved by the blood of the lamb. Again, uh, it may sound weird to a Jewish person. Well, uh, any, any other things? Oh, by the way, completed Jew. Don't use it. Oh, you, in Jesus, you will become a completed Jew. Oh, I know, Vladimir, he is a completed Jew. It's, you know what it means? Everybody else is like handicapped, you know? <laughs> like incomplete, like sort of like half Jew or something. Uh, it's, it's offensive terminology, so better you don't use it. Anyway, uh, our time is, uh, was quick. Uh, and too short, but uh, it was a joy and privilege for me to be with you tonight. Next week, uh, we are going to talk about another exciting subject, sharing the Messiah or showing the Messiah in Jewish traditions and holidays. Uh, it's going to be a fun night next week. I hope you will be able to come. Let me pray uh, in conclusion. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, we are grateful for this opportunity to enjoy you tonight, talking about you and talking about your Son and the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. We ask your blessing for us to be a good testimony with word and deed to everybody we meet, to everybody we know, Jews and Gentiles. We ask for your Spirit to work in us powerfully. Guide us, give us wisdom, give us right words and even right terminology and the right explanations. And give us humble spirit and loving spirit to encounter all possible objections. Let us speak your truth with love and give us the wisdom to speak your truth for love to be seen in what we say and what we do. And bless our journey home Bring us home safe and give us rest, good rest tonight. And wake us up tomorrow morning and let us glorify you. 
through all days of our life. We ask your blessing for us and our families. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much and see you next week, God's willing.